thanks very much. Look, it's my pleasure to um, to be here and everyone wears many hats. That's what I love about this very diverse space. And we're going deeper, I think, and deeper over the course of this day, over the course of the summit, and to um, a space where I think it really touches everyone. When we talk about um, how we transact um, in the blockchain space and the massive exchange of value, whether you want to denominate that a market capitalization, this is where people really uh, get get interested, right? They want to know that their investment is going to come back to them in some way, shape, or form. They want to be able to understand how to do the appropriate due diligence. So I'm very excited to be here with um, very esteemed panelists. So I've made good notes to introduce each one of you. Uh, Lorraine, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you are Lolo. <laughs> okay. so, so you're the business development lead at Omnisia. Um, this year is an industry expert in smart contracts and has deep expertise in building and securing complex decentralized networks and applications. And so I think you'll see um, for members of the public um, attendees, you can see links that um, Amy Rose has posted, which is groovy. Uh, Alicia, I'd like to introduce you now. Hello, Alicia. Welcome, welcome. Uh, you are the manager of digital assurance at Ernest & Young. Well, wow, you've got a pretty big role of responsibility. So I'll give the meta level development and review of internal controls for operational risk, regulatory technology and governance for Web3 uh, companies. Um, I particularly like the frameworks that you were using. Um, I kind of don't understand them all, but they look like we need them. <laughs> um, external financial audits for digital assets and Web3 companies or digital asset funds, very much needed um, in this day and age. And also you're involved in the reserve accounting statements for stablecoin issuers and asset-backed tokens. So welcome to you. Um, now I'd like to go to Vincent. Hello, Vincent. You're in Sydney. I forgot to tell everybody where you're from, but that's okay. We're all online. So that's the common denominator. Vincent, you are with Red Valley Network and the University of Sydney. You are CTO at the University of Sydney and Associate Professor there. And your key responsibilities are in releasing a blockchain. I'm Wonderful. CTO at Red Bay Network, not, not University of Sydney. <laughs> okay, Red Valley Network. Um, and also in ensuring security and participate and pro and protecting participants uh, in that space and then progressing innovations on self-sovereign identity, clearly very important um, issues. So welcome to you. And then Thank Fletcher, you. hello Fletcher. Well, you know, what do co-founders and directors of um, businesses not do, right? <laughs> Multivariate roles. So your business Hashlock is a fully independent smart contract auditing firm. And so we're going to get to know more about you as we progress. So look, it doesn't always help to start with the bad news, but let's go there. Um, Lorraine, let's talk about hacks and build up to best practices. I hope everybody's going to be in agreement with that. Why don't you um, give us an idea, you know, hacks are everything from, you know, phishing to scams to wallet, um, you, you know, exploits and, and problems. Why don't you give us kind of like a high level overview of, you know, what's happening um, in the space with regards um, to hacks, you know, they're the bane of the life of everybody in this space, but they're there. Thanks, Sophie. Um, yeah, hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Lolo or Lorraine. I'm the head of BD Alumnisia, as Sophie introduced me earlier. Um, we're a blockchain um, or security firm. Um, my focus there is on leads generation partnership and ma managing the sales process. But I'll just say a few words before I start um, about Omnisia, just to give a bit of context. Um, so we've been around for about two years, um, although our auditors have all been uh, auditing uh, smart contracts since it's been a thing. Um, and in just, in just two years, we've um, already audited over 240 projects, um, including major Web3 ecosystem players, such as Polygon, Avalab, uh, Gnosis, Olympus Dow, et cetera, and also Fortune 100 companies 
is like L'Oreal with Saint Laurent, etc. So here's just a bit of context. Um, yes, I'm going to get into the, the issue of hacks. Uh, so why are there so many hacks? It's a very good question. And, um, you know, there's been many exploits in the past few years. And unfortunately, their frequency and size keeps increasing. Uh, last year alone, I think over um, 3 billion were hacked mm -hmm. in 2022. And that doubled um, 2021's losses. Uh, so, you know, it's nothing's get, it's not getting better. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that most Web3 stacks are novel, open source and coordinate the flow of millions, if not billions um, of dollars worth of crypto assets makes them very attractive to uh, black hat hackers. Um, but one of the main reasons why we are seeing so many hacks these days is because there's a lot of... Uh, you know, not all audits are created equal, um, and there's a lot of um, large players with very little scrutiny in the in the blockchain security space. Um, what we've seen happen over the past couple of years is that a lot of the um, auditing firms have scaled their teams at the expense of quality. So they, you know, to meet the growing demand for, for audits, um, they've gotten greedy in a way, um, unfortunately. And so they've hired very junior developers who just don't have the required uh, blockchain and InfoSec experience to be able to conduct smart contract audits to a high standard. Uh, and this is one of the main reasons why we are seeing audited projects get hacked today. Um, in fact, some black hat hackers are specifically targeting some of these projects that have been audited by, audited by some of these firms because they know that the code quality is poor. Um, so there's a, there's a massive lack of skilled engineers in this space. And this is something that I cannot stress enough. Um, the, this technology is very new, as you well know, um, and uh, very few people know it well, and even fewer know it well enough to be able to think about, um, you know, potential economic and security exploits. Um, there's only about 100 to 200 highly skilled, um, you know, blockchain security engineers in the world right now. It's a very small number. And the reason for that is because um, you know, a lot of the talented white hat hackers, they're lone wolves, um, they're doing their own things. They've made tons of money off bug bounties in the last few years, and they're just not interested in being employed by anyone. Um, yeah, so this is a, you know, big issue that we're, we're seeing. Um, there's also a lack of regulations, um, you know, governing the industry. And, uh, you know, as a result, there's obviously many fraudulent projects and scams that target investors. That's another reason for, for hacks. Um, there's a lack of industry standards around blockchain security. Um, so currently, there's no clear frameworks or expectations when it comes to building or auditing smart contracts. Um, and there's little accountability, uh, you know, in the in the case of hacks um, from audit firms. So basically, audit firms bear no responsibilities in the in the case of hacks. Um, well, know, we have unpacked quite a lot there. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I'm, yep, yep. These are the main points. Sorry, I, I stopped talking. <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't mean it quite in that way, but it's great to see, you know, yeah. just what the complexities are, which build from a very low number of qualified um, security engineers and, you know, how that impacts an entire industry, you know, with the coin market cap back in 21 of around three three trillion almost um and you know now it's you know descended in the light of the bear market look i wouldn't mind just kind of framing up a little bit um you know let's alicia go to you and think about well look let's start building a little bit of a picture around you know well what are these um, blockchain orders let's get a sense for you know what what these are how can we rely upon them yeah, so I like the point that Lolo touched upon, which is there are different types of audits and there's a huge breadth of them and they each serve a different purpose for different set of risks for different investors and for different jurisdictions, right? There's financial statement audits, there are internal control audits, security audits, compliance audits. And the industry has, I think, shied away from audits so far because they want to place in uh, trust in the underlying technology. And while that is probably true for a 100% decentralized organization, we're not quite there yet. So I think, you know, if I were to put $100 in a market speculative asset, that's fine. But I probably wouldn't put my super fund into something like that just yet. I'd need more than a smart contract audit. 
And what I'm trying to get to is that I think the entire Web3 environment, along with the Web2 environment of the company, needs to be audited um, to provide the investor or customer an adequate level of assurance. Um, so, for example, I would be concerned about the segregation of client monies, or if you're giving me a proof of reserve audit, then how do I know that um, the reserves are not pledged or have any hidden liabilities um, in them? So I think considering these wider aspects um, is very important. And we all come from, a, well, most of us come from a Web2 background, and it's essentially drawing the same risks from Web2 and applying them to Web3. So yes, I'm looking at key management in Web3, but I'm also looking at access. I'm looking at segregation of duties risk. I'm looking at key person risks. And these are uh, these are the same across the board. So uh, my question to the industry is like, why aren't we having greater conversations um, broader than smart contract audits? Look at the environment. Um, I think a classic example would be the oil of finance hack that recently happened, which has had about 10 audits in the last two years in terms of smart contracts, but still drained due to a code exploit for 200 million. So, um, and I think as an industry, we should be working towards um, these sort of frameworks. So right now, while regulation um, drafts up and they are heading in that direction. So right now we have like SOC 2 and ISO frameworks that are predominantly being aligned on. Thanks, Fletch. I'd like you to start weighing in now, if um, you will, around, you know, um, smart contracts and, yeah, like, what's your opinion on, you, you know, their validity? I mean, they clearly have um, a, a place and it seems like, according to Alicia, you know, they have been over relied upon. Right. No, it's, it's very important to kind of start from the beginning because, Smart contract auditing definitely is a bit of a buzzword, I feel like. Um, and you've seen it within the industry as Lolo and Alicia sort of talked about. Uh, a smart contract audit isn't the only part of blockchain security, um, but it is a huge part. So it might be good to start from the beginning. What is a smart contract audit uh, and what is a smart contract? So a smart contract is um, in very layman's code as properties. Uh, is that one? It's uh, essentially permanent uh, and that it handles an asset. Um, uh, it's a automatic execution of permanent assets moving is a kind of a bit of an analogy you can make there. And so uh, one of the difficulties is um, talking about uh, why is it different from a normal traditional um, Web2 environment audit? Um, and it, it does kind of go down to those characteristics uh, that most blockchains have. Um, and so when you're doing a smart contract audit, what that really means uh, is that you're trying to find vulnerabilities um, within the code, hopefully while it's on um, test net or a, a, a non-deployed permanent state so that changes can still be made. Um, and the best firms are able to do that through manual analysis. Um, so unfortunately, tools, uh, while some uh, companies rely very heavily on tools, uh, manual analysis is the only way to um, really um, dig down and, and find most of those economic or you know um, logic uh, vulnerabilities in smart contracts you probably find that in a bug bounty space which is where most of um, the really good auditors come from um, in a bug bounty space probably 90 80 to 90 percent of those high level vulnerabilities are found through manual analysis so that's what a smart contract audit is but that's only one layer uh, in the blockchain security environment. Uh, you've also got the blockchain, which I know Vincent will talk very much about. So I'll leave that to, to Vincent. Um, and as Alicia was saying, um, especially within corporates, you've also got, um, you know, a, for example, we always see uh, stable coins that yes, they might have a very simple templated smart contract, right? But um, you can't really, it, it's it, it, with just a smart contract audit, how are you going to guarantee that it has the backing that it says it has? And there's, there's a whole bunch of things. So a good firm will never um, use their smart contract audit as a comprehensive end or be all. Um, but a smart contract audit is letting you know that the smart contract itself permanently handling these assets uh, is um, as best as that auditing firm can can provide and yes there is very varying ranges of quality but as best as that auditing firm can can say that there are, are no vulnerabilities left and helping them fix them uh and that's why you see firms sometimes getting even multiple audits uh just the way that the industry sort of evolved unfortunately um so yeah that's kind of a little bit of a basis level of what a smart contract audit is why it's different from traditional auditing um and it's a little bit about how it uh, actually works within the industry 
Great. So maybe, yes, it would be a good idea now, Vincent, if you could come in on top of that and like give us some definitions around, you know, the network overall and, you know, what we're looking at there. And I know that you've got some clear ideas around, you know, how we are misconceiving, in fact, <laughs> the various types of, you know, security that we can actually, you know, enjoy at the moment from, um, the, well, the, the ideals that we have, we sometimes tend to feel that blockchains are by their very inherent nature secure. I think that's um, a misnomer out there. So, yeah. No, I'm, yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, I think there are often misconceptions, which is probably due to the diversity of the blockchain offerings uh, that there are out there. Uh, it's very hard for users or even developers to choose the right uh, solution. But before going into that, I, I wanted to follow up on some of the things that were discussed. And in particular, I wanted to highlight the point that Lolo made at the beginning with this more than 3 billion loss in uh cryptocurrency theft and the fact that, that most of these thefts are coming from the DeFi space. And what it essentially means is that it comes from applications running on top of blockchains that usually make use of smart contracts, right? So smart contract audit is, is also something interesting. Um, but I also understand the approach of Alicia, which is why don't we go holistically and try to, you know, audit um uh, all other things that comes along with a smart contract. And there is a, a particular component that is very important in a blockchain technology, which is the, the platform itself that serves as the base on which the, the, the centralized application or the smart contracts can be built. Um, and, and this blockchain layer, uh, this is something we have been focusing on at Redbelly Network. So I can talk a little bit about my experience. We've been working on making sure that some of these building blocks that sits at the bottom on this platform are secure. So, for example, you have a, a code that describes how the consensus protocol should try to, um, you know, make sure all the machines in the network agree with each other. And uh, and this protocol is has been defined ahead of time, right? Like uh, uh, before the network was launched. And uh, and so. For us, what we have been doing is we worked on formal verification. We did that for more than a year. It was a big project involving researchers in Europe and in the US. And we looked at the code and we made sure that uh, there was a way for a machine to tell us that the, the proof of our protocol, the, our protocol was doing essentially what it was supposed to do. Uh, but it, take, it took us more than a year, right? So then, now if you start thinking about the, the OBOL layer that you have in decentralized application and smart contracts, uh, these are smart contracts that can be uploaded any day, right? And, and so the big difference between the, the, the base layer that you can audit and you can spend your time working on it for years before launching your network um, and, and the, the smart contracts that will be uploaded and cannot be verified in real time, you know, indicates where the stress can come from in terms of security. Um, but to go back to your initial point um, and the notion of, um, uh, you know, I think there's a lack of standard around blockchain security uh, guarantees. And and, uh, and I remember talking to companies, it was five years ago, but I still think that this is still true. There are blockchain companies who are trying to build, you know, quantum resilience on top of blockchain technologies that are not even secure to malicious intrusion which you know, it indicates that there is a mismatch in the understanding of what the blockchain is supposed to offer, which could be crash for tolerance or at least tolerate outages and some solutions that they're building to uh, cope with you know, people who can intrude with a quantum computer. And, and the fact that you know, they are building this extra security on something that is not even secure indicates that there is a misconception. And to solve this problem, I think we have to go down the path of education and try to make sure that people get more knowledge around this technology and what it can offer. I mean, you know, that's a very good point. Uh, you know, education and then for whom? I mean, there are many participants um, in this space, um, from users to investors in, the, in, the, in DeFi, you know, um, you know, myself included with the uh, Terra protocol, you know, people who are investing, if you will, um, and even the businesses that are creating themselves. So maybe we could just um, 
yeah, take a little look at education and start to kind of piece together uh, best practices. Like what are we thinking in terms of like how can improvements be made um, in the area of security and audits? I know that's a very broad uh, question, but you know, I'm just happy for panelists to, to chime in um, as they feel. Really good question. Um, if it's an open one, I think the the best the first thing you want to do with a smart contract audit um, agreement, if, if you're a protocol and you're going to get your smart contracts audited at the end of development is um, first of all, making sure that one of the best ways to assure that your smart contracts are going to be in safe hands uh, is looking at um, one of the best identifiers is bug bounty experience. Um, so, and, and it goes back to what Vince was saying, there is a lack of sort of best practice um, and standards and so the best way currently is understanding uh, are these people able to find, you know, through manual analysis uh, and in a bug bounty competitive setting, are they able to find uh, a high level of vulnerabilities? Uh, that's kind of the first thing. Um, and then I, I agree. I think we need to kind of build a, a more rigid approach because uh, as Lola was saying, you know, there's, what does a smart contract audit really mean? That There's sort of different levels to one. Um, and it's uh, a bit hard to understand what you're going to get, uh, what they're actually auditing. Uh, and so that's kind of my take on it. I think at the moment, you just have to look um, at a couple of key factors. And I think one of them is uh, one of the best ones is bug bounty experience, I think. I totally agree with um, Fletcher, actually. Um, the problem that we're seeing is that a lot of the, and as Fletcher mentioned as well, a lot of the audit firms out there, in fact, like 90% of audit firms out there uh, will only conduct, uh, uh, you know, uh, static analyzing review of the contract. Um, you know, they'll use publicly available tools such as Slither or Echidna or um, tools like that to just run a, an initial scan of the contracts. Um, but this is, um, you know, these tools are number one, they're publicly available, so anyone can use them. You don't have to, you know, pay an auditor to do it. Um, number two, these tools, uh, they they just don't pick up on all the vulnerabilities and especially not all the critical ones. Um, and, you know, if there's uh, logical errors behind the code, the, the software won't work as intended either. So this is not enough, uh, as you said, as Fletcher said, you need a you know a manual review uh, of the code by a, by a skilled engineer who's going to go through the code line by line and look out for uh, you know common attack vectors, but more importantly, uncommon attack vectors and edge cases. Um, and this is something that you only you know only a skilled engineer with a lot of many years experience is going to be able to do that well, um, and also. There's a difference between, um, you know, being a good developer and being a good auditor, I think, um, you know, uh, being a good auditor is essentially, uh, it's like if you're, I'll give you an example, but if you're trying to build a house, uh, you, you're going to want to hire a builder to do it, right? Someone who can put, you know, lay one brink on, on top of the other, put the house together. But if you wanted to break into a house, you wouldn't get a, a builder to do it. You'd get someone who, um, you know, knows how to bypass the security system, who knows where the owner might hide the keys, whether there's a dog on the property, things like that. Uh, and this is the difference between a developer and an auditor. Um, so it just, it's just a completely different skill set. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's, yeah. So what are you seeing then um, in terms of the blockchain base layer, uh, Vincent, um, and the potential for, you know, instituting, you know, best practices there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So going through education, I think, is is, is key. Uh, um, th there is a lot of misconception around what, you know, this, this blockchain layer can offer. For example, what you see in the blockchain is what you get. This is what people expect from a blockchain technology simply because there is this nice property of immutability, right? So as soon as you um, store a log or a piece of information in the blockchain, then immutability tells you that it will stay forever. But the reality is that most of the blockchains would fork, right? It means that at some particular index of the chain, you might end up having multiple blocks that are competing with each other. Uh, eventually this will be resolved, but it also, me also means that when you look at the blockchain, when you see a transaction that is in one of these conflicting blocks, then you're, you don't have the guarantee that this transaction will remain, right? So, I, I, and for different blockchains come different properties, right? So it's it's a bit unclear for a lot of people, like, um, you know, when you use uh, 
um, Solana, you, you have this fork that is possible, right? So you have to wait until, you know, the blocks are confirmed such that you can be sure that what you have seen, like the transaction you saw in this trans in this block will, will be uh, there forever. You have to wait, right? You cannot be sure instantaneously. So all this misconception can lead to dramatic errors, right? Even uh, uh, because the users are not educated enough on that, they may not know about this, uh, that the fact that immutability is not always guaranteed or you have to wait to get immutability, then they might be fooled by a hacker that will show them that they have done a payment while the payment will never arrive. Um, so these things will take a long time, and I think we're progressing very well in that direction. Now, there is a lot of content online that allows people to get a better understanding about blockchain technology, what it offers, uh, what it doesn't offer. For example, it's in most of the cases fully transparent, and it doesn't solve the problem of privacy, even though it offers other security um, uh, features. Um, and I think people are getting a better and better understanding of that. Is it's also very important that uh, developers, um, when they build on a platform, especially in the DeFi ecosystem, uh, try to understand what is the underlying property of the particular technology that they have chosen, right? So if they go for something that is, you know, toy apps, then they may decide to go for a blockchain that is not extremely secure. But as soon as they want to trade high value assets, which is, you know, the trend in DeFi, then I think they should look into uh, more secure technologies that offer some, you know, fork proofness, for example. Right. Um, but again, there are many tools on, out there uh, online. Um, you know, we teach blockchain uh, as part, I teach blockchain as part of distributed systems at the University of Sydney. We also have a MOOC, a massive open online course where we have more than 4,000 students, you know, following and trying to understand how they can scale blockchain. Well, that's great to know. And, and I think, and I think uh, these things are good, but they're not enough, right? We also need accreditation uh, such that university can really deliver, uh, you know, degrees on blockchain technology to make sure that there is a, um, you know, a level, like a standard level of knowledge that can be delivered. And we've got some way to go, haven't we, to get there? I mean, we're in progress by just being very aware, I believe, of all of the issues um, and, and concerns. And, you know, as you say, education is, is a really huge thing. Alicia, I'm just wondering, I mean, you do have a more holistic perspective on bringing, you know, web to, to audits and analysis to the space. Like, what would you consider to be, you know, the, the best practice from your perspective? Um, yeah, just thinking about, like, okay. I want to investor or a customer, if I go to a, a project, a DeFi project online, and I look and I see, yes, you have a smart contract, you've tested against certain vulnerabilities, but there are several audits and there are several vulnerabilities. How do you know that um, the code is assured over the entire year? Um, because this is a very point in time um, kind of look at code review. So you, some of the other aspects you can look at are like the governance and decentralization. How, how is it all working, you know, how is the key management controls working? How are your cybersecurity of your platforms working? And um, the custody management and how, how, who has access to all of that? Where are your funds actually going? I think a more holistic understanding is required um, because there are a lack of standards as well in this smart security uh, contract space. So I think just keeping an eye out for that. And, um, you know, working with um, an auditing firm that gives you a control suite that can work for a longer period of time. And I think doing that is tricky in such a fast paced environment because the process of organizing your control suite together for an audit, for an attestation can change very quickly um, because you have to go back, fix your controls, fix the way they operate, and then um, come back and get it tested again by an auditing firm and then issue a report, but by then everything might have changed. So I think sustainability and reliability of control is another point to um, pay attention to. And what I also wanted to touch on um, before we come to an end in about five minutes is like selecting an audit um, firm. I mean, you know, it's, it's not altogether obvious, but there are clearly, you know, a couple of criteria, several criteria. So why don't we um, quickly address that? I mean, a comment from you, Lolo, from Fletcher. Um, I mean, everyone, I mean, Leisha, you are involved as well. And then Vincent, um, yeah, please give us your key consideration that you would look at. Just one in the interest of time. Yeah, great. 
For me, I'll just say one. There's many factors that you need to consider when I get, you know, when shopping around for an audit. But I'll just focus on uh, one uh, in, in the interest of time. The main one, which in my opinion is uh, to check the breadth and depth of uh, recent audit reports. Um, you know, uh, because a lot of um, the teams have changed in the past few years, it's very important to check um, the audit firm that you're talking to, to check their, their recent report get someone technical in your team to have a look um, and see you know what the level of detail and expertise is um, keep in mind that most auditors will find several issues um, including critical ones um, in the code so yeah th this is for me the main thing that you need to look for thanks Lana. Peter? I was to follow up on that which I 100% agree with I think, and uh, if it's aside from the vulnerabilities found and the um, bug bounty experience, the, the last one that I'd focus on is their communication strategy. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of auditing firms that won't really um, have a, you know, solid grounding in communication with a client, can work with corporates, can work with blockchain native companies. Um, can you sort of offer that consulting and support on other levels after and before the smart contract audit? Um, and provide more of a holistic security approach? Uh, and can you really partner with a company and, and you know, hold their hand throughout the process or, or a blockchain native application as well? Um, and, you know, uh, in summary, I think communication is, is very important and, and rare um, to do well within um, a blockchain uh, security and smart contract auditing uh, firm. So, yeah, communication. Particularly helping businesses to know what they um, what's included and what and what's not. Alicia, from that more holistic, you know, financial experience, what more could you add to that in terms of you know what you would be looking for? And recommend? Yeah, I think I'd be looking for um, one is like I was saying the sustainability of controls that the auditing firm can come up with. I wouldn't want an unrealistic picture of controls that uh, if I had a Web three company wouldn't be able to match up to or um, to demonstrate at the execution of those. And then the other thing is, um, I think it'd be useful if the firm could guide us correctly according to the themes or the trends that regulation is coming up with or that frameworks are uh, moving towards so that you can look forward to those developments as well and incorporating them. Thanks. Vincent, like from the, from the perspective of blockchains, like I'm sure you have many that, you know. Yeah. So no, I think blockchain auditing and security. So sorry, smart contract auditing is is really important. is crucial, and we're ourselves looking into that and and asking experts to help us doing that at the moment. But uh, but it's true that uh, there are also best practices that should be put in place within the organization, and maybe that 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 touches on what Alicia was saying. But I think we we should never underestimate the the human factor and the the security vulnerabilities that can be you know, um, uh, triggered by this uh, type of problems, like just a mistake that can be done by a human and by offering, you know, processes and best, best practices within the organization that can be, you know, followed along for the long term, I think is, is key to reducing the number of vulnerabilities as well. Well, I think it's time for us to wrap up. We've got another panel coming in on the end of us. I really want to thank um, Lolo, Alicia, Vincent and uh, Fisha for your time. Uh, there are connections, I think, in the chat box for anybody who wants to reach out to you. Um, please do so. Um, yeah, it's really been my pleasure. This is, I think, one of the more oblique areas, I would say, um, as a fundamental analyst for people to really uh, get their heads around. So I would like hope, I think, for the future to see a lot more positivity and you know, uptick, um, particularly in the area of education, helping, you know, participants, users, investors, even uh, project creators themselves to really skill themselves up in um, being more aware and holistic, I think, in their approach uh, and realistic in terms of their undertakings, you know, to every one of those stakeholders about uh, the security um, of, you know, their projects um, and also the audits that um, are being offered. So thank you very much for your time. And I think we're out of time here. So um, all the best. Thank you, Sophie.